Welcome. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Terrific. Uh, I am Suzanne Clary. I'm the president of the Board of Trustees of the Jay Harris Center, and we are thrilled to welcome you here on this absolutely gorgeous day when you could be anywhere else. But I'm going to assume you all had your walks, got your steps in this morning, saw our gardens, you know, you've been out and about, and now you're ready for a really incredibly uh, compelling program. Um, it is my honor to introduce our two speakers, first uh, David Wallstriker and then Ian Haley Pollock. Um, David Wallstriker um, has actually been here before a number of years ago, very long time ago, 1999. He saw us when we were just becoming. You know, when we were just an idea, and in fact, we were talking earlier about the fact that there was there were there were many people who were imagining what this place could be. Um, one of those was Gretchen Sto Gretchen Soren herself an author of a very well-known book called Driving While Black, and she said, this is the perfect place to discuss the unfinished topic of race and land. And, and we have been hosting programs about uh, African-American history, indigenous history. You know, this is a, a, a place for people to ask questions. Um, and we're gonna hear from David Wallstriker and um, Ian Haley Pollock, um, and afterwards ask a lot of questions. So, so so keep those, those questions in the back of your mind. Um, uh, so uh, David is a historian of uh, 19, early 19th century America with particular interests in political history, cultural history, slavery, anti-slavery, and print culture. He has previously, as I said, spoken at JSC, and that talk was titled Another View of the American Revolution. And who knows what we're gonna be celebrating in 2026? Raise your hand. Ah, all right, all right, 1776, 2026, yes. <laughs> Everyone is gearing up for 2026, and when we, we uh, talk about the revolution, we want to make sure we're inclusive and we tell the stories of everyone, and not just men. And uh, we, we want to tell the story of, uh, stories of, of women, like uh, Phyllis Wheatley, which is why we're having this program today. Um, David's latest book, The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley, A Poet's Journey Through American Slavery and Independence, is the most deeply researched biography of the poet. The New York Times, in a recent feature on the book, um, said that Wall Stryker uh, put Wheatley smack in the middle of the raging debate over the relationship between the American Revolution and slavery and praised his achievement in not only tracing her life, but also recreating the 18th century intellectual world Wheatley actually lived in. And what's fascinating is a lot of her poems track current events of the time. You know, so, 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 so think about that. You read one of these poems, and you can look at the, the, the current event, the, sorry, the events of the, of the period and imagine what, what, what is happening through her eyes. Um, and uh, we have uh, David, sorry, sorry um, Ian Haley Pollock, who is the director of um, uh, creative writing at Manhattanville College. He is going to be uh, talking with David, and he is himself a poet. Um, and a professor of creative writing. He, uh, uh, Ian has uh, two poetry collections, maybe m more than that, actually, right? A third is coming, that's what I thought, okay. <laughs> uh, Spit Back a Boy and Ghost Like a Place. Um, his poems have also appeared in many literary outlets, including African American Review, American Academy of Poets, Poem a Day, American Poetry Review, so many different um, recognitions. And because we're in Rye, we're exceptionally proud of the fact that he um, also curated Rye's Poetry Path, um, which was a public uh, poetry installation here in, in our town. Um, so the format of this event is going to be, uh, I'm going to invite um, David to come up to the, uh, the, the podium here and take a chair. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. And uh, also, uh, it, David, so you also know, so we have two professors, teaches um, history at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Um, and his other books also are uh, Slavery, uh, uh, Slavery's Constitution from Evolution to Ratification. Um, we can ask questions about these other books too. Um, at the end of this program, we do have, have books for people who would like to get them signed. Remember to say that. Um, and Ian, you're going to come up and, and uh, say a few words. And please wake, welcome Ian, and we'll start the program. 
Thank you so much for having uh, us, Susan and Lori. Thank you for roping me into this. <laughs> Um, yeah, when I agreed to do something in early March, I thought it would be an overcast Sunday, maybe a little snow, and, and look at it out. Uh, so thank you all for, for giving up a beautiful day to, to come um, hear our program. Um, I'm excited to spend the next hour celebrating the life and, and legacy of Phyllis Wheatley Peters and celebrating David's recent book, The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley. Um, for me, the book offers a rigorous and capacious examination of Wheatley Peter's life and times. It's part biography of an enslaved African girl surviving trauma and working toward her freedom in colonial America, part cautionary tale of a free African woman trying to make a place for herself in a nascent America. It's part literary explication of how a pioneering black poet worked within the conventions of her neoclassical age to advance her humanity inscribe personal and cultural memories of Africa into her verse, and stake her claim on her world. And it is part reconsideration of the role that enslaved people, their desire for freedom, and the discourse around enslavement and freedom played in the founding of our country. Um, as we proceed, David and I thought it would be really important um, to fully understand Wheatley Peters' life and enduring legacy, to hear her poems, uh, as well as poetic responses of 20th and 21st century um, poets. So we're gonna proceed sort of by call and response. The call will be me reading a poem, and the response will be David dropping his voluminous knowledge about the subject. Um, so I will begin um, with a poem by the writer um, Margaret Walker, who I guess this will come out later, sort of helped um, rehabilitate the, the legacy of, of Phyllis Wheatley. And this poem was written for the bicentennial celebration of the publication of Phyllis Wheatley's poems on various subjects, religious and moral, 1773. Ballad for Phyllis Wheatley. Pretty little black girl standing on the block how have you withstood this shame, bearing all this shock? How have you succeeded weathering the trip? How have you come through the stench, riding on this stinking ship? Pretty little black girl, come, go home with me. I will take you far away from this painful sea. This is little Phyllis, shedding two front teeth. This is little Phyllis, caught and torn beneath all the bright canopy of her native land, caught and kidnapped far away from her native land. Child bereft of mother, father stricken so. What will happen to our little one? Who will see her grow? Boston is a cold town, ice and snow and rain. Nothing like a tropical world, nothing like the plain I have known in Africa, warm and soft and green. I am sick for Africa, take me home again. And I cannot, and I think I cannot bear all the anguish here, faces pale, and men with whips, danger always near. Pretty little black girl, no one now can see all the greatness you will know, all that you will be. Pretty little black girl, standing on the block, how have you withstood the shame, bearing all this shock? This is really one of my favorites of the poems written by black women writers in an era that really resuscitated Wheatley's reputation uh, after a period when the dominant view uh, among people who, those who actually noticed and continued to talk about Wheatley, was that she was distanced and different from the masses of black people, that she didn't have much in common with them because she had such an unusual experience of becoming a famous poet because she uh, was educated because she lived in a city as opposed to on a plantation. So what Walker does here is she actually uses some of the few facts that we have that were handed down in the Wheatley family that Wheatley herself said in letters uh, to try to imagine what her experience was like while still acknowledging, making the central theme of the poem, how little we know. I can't, like, I, I have, she has to imagine what her experience is like, because Wheatley doesn't tell us that much about it. So, there must have been an auction block. 
was actually probably it was actually probably uh, actually on the ship. Or at least that's what one of the Wheatley descendants uh, said that uh, Mrs. Wheatley went to the ship and bought her right off the ship the Phyllis that she came in on. Um, the 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 thing about the teeth was that that there were that um, they estimated her age based on the fact that she lost it some people. Um, because she was such a prodigy, and we were wanting to know how old, how old is she? How long has she been here? How could she possibly have learned enough English to be writing such good English poetry uh, and such learned, such with so many re references that were both classical and religious in such a short time? So her age was always an issue uh, as, a, as a prodigy. And uh, the contrast between Boston and Africa, and the uh, the question about just how how what it was like for her to lose her family but be old enough to remember them. And it's something that she does talk about. She, she uh, in her poem to Lord Dartmouth, she explicitly invokes uh, her father's loss. Uh, and so that so that's why uh, that's why Walker says uh, talks about the, the father's um, uh, missing her being uh, lost. And, and there are several poems in which she talks about Africa. The most famous one is, 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 is we'll, we'll get to. There are some others where she talks about this image of Africa as being a green, verdant place so different than, than cold Boston. And, and she's, uh, Walker is, is evoking that. And um, though the, the lo longing for Africa is something that she couldn't really say. I think it's fair to say that she may have longed for it and that she and other, her, uh, other members of her cohort, which was a lot of people, she knew a lot of people who had come over around the time she did and who were of a similar age, that, that longing wasn't something that white people wanted to hear. And so one of the things that Walker's doing is saying, okay, Wheatley doesn't tell us everything that's on her mind in her poems, but there are some things that we can take what we know and then extrapolate from other things we know about that, about that common experience. And that, the, I tried to be true to that in the book that, uh, while indicating when I'm speculating and when I'm relying on evidence that doesn't come directly from contemporaries, uh, that isn't documented but, other, but is otherwise plausible, but plausible in a way that's specific to that generation, specific to Boston, specific to her, her experience, what it was like to come from West Africa in the 1750s as opposed to other times. Uh, that, that was extremely important to me to sort of say, okay, here's what we know, here's what we can guess, and um, not and not just make up the rest based on what we know about 300 years of millions of people experiences as, uh, as if it was all the same thing uh you brought up the the dartmouth poem so I'll, I'll read that one next and this is one of the poems that does speak directly to events that were current to her um which is a a, a strain of of her poems is, is commenting on the action and uh, the politics of of the day to the extent that um, she was able to to the Right Honorable William, Earl of Dartmouth, His Majesty's Principal Secretary of State for North America, etc. I love her, she has some really long titles that are just wonderful. By Phyllis Wheatley. Hail happy day, when smiling like the morn, fair freedom rose New England to adorn. The northern climb beneath her genial ray, Dartmouth congratulates thy blissful sway. Elate with hope, her race no longer mourns. Each soul expands, each grateful bosom burns. While in thine hand, with pleasure, we behold the silken reins and freedom's charms unfold. Long lost to realms beneath the northern skies, she, saw, she shines supreme while hated faction dies. Soon as appeared the goddess long desired, sick at the view, she languished and expired. Thus, from the splendors of the morning light, the owl in sadness seeks the caves of night. No more, America, in, mournf in mournful strain of wrongs and grievance unredressed complain. No longer shalt thou dread the iron chain which wanton tyranny with lawless hand had made and with it meant to enslave the land. Should you, my lord, while you peruse my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, Whence flow these wishes for the common good? By feeling hearts alone best understood, I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancied happy seat. 
what pangs excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breast. Steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case. And can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway? For favors past, great sir, our thanks are due. And thee we ask thy favors to renew, since in thy power, as in thy will before, to soothe the griefs which thou didst once deplore. May heavenly grace the sacred sanction give to all thy works, and though forever live not only on the wings of fleeting fame, though praise immortal crowns the patriot's name, but to conduct to heaven's refulgent fane, may fiery coursers sweep the ethereal plain and bear thee upward to that blessed abode where, like the prophet, thou shalt find thy God. So this is a praise poem. Who is this guy? Lord Dartmouth, why is she writing to him? Two things that everyone knows about Lord Dartmouth. Everyone who would read this poem, certainly in New England, also in England, is that Lord Dartmouth is the new undersecretary of state for the colonies. It's a major cabinet post. He has served in a similar capacity like five years before. And so this is 1773 and the Patriot protest movement has been going on for a while. And one of the reasons it sort of waxes and wanes is that British politics keeps overturning who's in charge, who's the, who's the prime minister, which party is in, char is in charge. As far as Bostonians are concerned, when Lord Dartmouth comes back, the good guys are back in. They know that he is more sympathetic to the colonies and they think, oh, we're gonna, he's going to get rid of these taxes that we don't like. The other thing that everyone knows about Lord Dartmouth is that he's an evangelical Methodist. He is, um, has been a supporter of charitable efforts to convert the natives. He is friends with the Countess of Huntingdon uh, and um, helped sponsor George Whitfield's visit. He is one of the people who um, is connected to these evangelical circles that Susanna Wheatley, the um, Phyllis's enslaver, is connected to, and these are the folks who they are, um, who are very, very interested in the idea of a young African enslaved woman who uh, is can show that she is converted and a genius, and and um, they're less interested in what this means for slavery than the possibility that this will help us convert the Africans and turn this thing, which is starting to make people in England and America embarrassed, uh, turn slavery into an engine of progress and Christianity. So Phyllis has already written to, uh, they've already sent poems to the Countess of Huntingdon. And this is a kind, this is, this is really the poem that gets her to England uh, uh, and gets her, gets her poems published because uh, and, and the story I, I tell in the book, and if I tell this story too, I'm gonna go on, probably go on too long. But uh, this guy, who, this guy, Wooldridge, who um, is a, knows Dartmouth well from their home county and who's a colonial official in Florida, is, he's kind of in trouble in Florida and he makes a tour of the northern colonies and he, um, he gets to Boston and his wife probably suggests this. He, they, he goes to see Phyllis Wheatley and, he write, and then he writes this letter to Lord Dartmouth and encloses this poem. And he says, you know, I heard about Phyllis Wheatley. I thought you'd be interested in her. So I went, and so I, I went, and I, I kind of, I, I was maybe I was a little skeptical. I said, could you write, I said, could you write a poem? Like, and this is, so this is what she's been dealing with for years. Like people being skeptical, people saying, maybe you didn't write these poems, maybe you're getting help. So she like, so perform for me, right? So what she does is she says, okay, come back and come back tomorrow. Like, and so like, you know, like, like, like a gentlewoman, she says, like, uh, you know, I'll receive you tomorrow afternoon, right? So he comes back and she got this poem that's like 55 lines long, you know, like it's, it's amazing and it's long and it's not short. 
And she's got, I mean, she must, she probably, the, the news about Lord Dartmouth that it was only about three or four weeks old, she had, must have read this in the newspaper. People are talking about it. She's spinning her, she's thinking, am I going to, she's, she's got this, like, in, she had, may not have written it yet, but she's got it in her pocket. And when she comes back, she's got this poem and she gives him an autographed copy and he sends it off, like it sends it off and shows what a good, and, it, and uh, sends it off to his patron and, uh, as part of doing, doing her. So by this point, she is aware of what can be accomplished by circulating her poems in particular ways. So, okay, so what does that have to do with what she actually does in the poems, in the poem? Well, the first part of it is she's showing that when, when she talks about um, her race no longer mourns, her race is, is New England. She's identifying with New England and its, and its freedoms, which are now going to be secured because of Lord Dartmouth. Long, long lost to realms beneath the northern skies. Um, you know, uh, and the goddess liberty is shining. No more America in mournful strain of wrongs and grievous unredressed complain. No long shalt thou dread the iron chain. So she's taking that patriot rhetoric of saying they're enslaving us by these taxes and she's literalizing it and she's adopting it and she says, you know, I can do this too. And you know what? It has a point. She's completely taking the patriot side. She's showing that she can do this, do this thing and speak for New England. And that's what, in, that's what licenses her to turn around and said, oh, you're wondering well, how I can talk this way? Let me tell you. I know more about slavery and freedom than anybody else here. And that enables her to tell, in a poem for the first time, her own story of enslavement. It's really the only poem in which she tells it. So that link between the patriot movement, like why is she so supportive of the patriot movement? They're so hypocritical. It's actually the patriot movement and making this, all this talk about slavery and freedom that enables her to get away with something that she hasn't been able to do before. So that's why, so she, why does she write so many poems about political events? Why does she write so many praise poems for these elite white men? That's, that's why. And she's able to do this thing that pushes the envelope at this very moment when other Africans in Boston are being more ambitious in the protests they're making against slavery. So that's what I think, that's what I think is going on there and why this is, this is my favorite of, of Wheatley's poems because it's the one that illustrates these points about how the, the politics of the revolution and the politics of slavery are coming together in this moment and she is building on it to do things that haven't been done before and doing it in a particularly a way that's, that's very specific and informed about events that are happening in real time but also very feminine. Like, it's not an accident that it's a woman doing this as a poet at a time when there haven't been any slave narratives yet. Well, they're starting to be, and they're starting to be sponsored by people like Countess Huntingdon. Kuoano's slave narrative is being written and published right around this time, but it really isn't a, isn't a, big, a big thing yet. Um, and that starts out with men, enslaved men who have this Atlantic experience and are able to talk about it and, and say, you know, if we, we really need to question whether this is really an engine of, of oppression and godlessness or can be turned into something that will be redemptive. She's doing it in a different way, but doing it in a specifically political and New England way. I'm also... When you read the poems, I'm impressed by her empathy. She's often writing to people who have just lost a loved one, and I see that empathy in this poem as well, right? Like, I have been enslaved, and therefore I never want other people, I can understand what you're feeling and never want other people to, to be enslaved. Um, I want to read her Ode to, to Neptune next. Um, and there's an epigraph on Mrs. W's voyage to England. One, while raging tempests shake the shore, while Aeolus's thunders round us roar and sweep impetuous over the plain, be still, O tyrant of the main, nor let thy brow contracted frows betray while my Susanna skims the watery way. Two, the power propitious hears the lay, the blue-eyed daughters of the sea with sweeter cadence glide along and Thames responsive joins the song. Pleased with their notes, soul sheds benign his rays, and double radiance decks the face of day. Three, to court thee to Britannia's arms, serene the climes and mild the sky, her region boasts unnumbered charms, 
thy welcome smiles in every eye. Thy promise, Neptune, sorry, thy promise, Neptune, keep, record my prayer, not give my wishes to the empty air. You, you call the book the Odyssey of, of Phyllis Wheatley, um, so I wanted to throw in one of her sea poems to, to help, help you explain that, that choice. Oh, there's, there's, there's so much here. I'll start with the, um, those classical references. Aeolus, the god of the winds, the east wind, uh, is also present in the first poem she published uh, in, that was in a newspaper in Newport in 1767, which is about a shipwreck. And uh, we also have uh, um, Britannia as a, a, a like a, a, a classical female figure and Neptune, uh, who, uh, the, the god of the sea. Why does Wheatley, a Christian poet, uh, bother with these classical references? I was educated to, uh, and I, uh, I was telling Ian, I was an English major uh, and, uh, as well as a history major in college, and then I went and got my PhD in American studies. Uh, and while I had an interest in neoclassical stuff and ended up specializing in that, that late 18th, early 19th century period that is so neoclassical, as I, I can just test your over <laughs> at the columns right here. It's perfect. What a, what a great prop. I was like... Couldn't be, couldn't, I don't usually get to do this. I usually have to conjure <laughs> it out of thin air. Um, uh, I, I, ne I never read uh, these, these Greek and Roman classics because uh, when I was coming up, um, it was, everyone was, uh, we were, there was all the, there were the canon wars and people were saying, oh, that's the deadest of dead white male literature. What does that have to do with with people today, we can't possibly relate to it. It's not really universal. It's 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 biased, and so I I always thought of this as I it was and and that and all those references have been something that's made it hard for folks to really uh, appreciate Wheatley and what she's doing because she's talking to people who know all these references and and we don't anymore. But when I was working on when I started to work on Wheatley, I realized I needed to read everything that she had read. I needed to bone up really uh, on this stuff and when I read or and and listened on a book on tape while I was commuting to the Odyssey that something a light bulb went off it really clicked for me I realized that the Odyssey is a book about shipwrecks enslavement the traffic in women war the Medi a, a, a world that is coastal and full of islands in the Mediterranean. And um, like, like and in the Iliad, the, the, the dra whole drama of the Iliad is around this enslaved woman who, as a prize. And I realized, so Phyllis Wheatley is reading this, and this world is not that, doesn't sound that different from the 18th century Atlantic, which is also a place of voyages, enslavement, and uh, war, and especially and especially this this uh, traffic in women. So that's that 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 made me realize that when Wheatley Wheatley can't talk directly about her experience, but talking about that those Greek and Roman worlds is a way to address it and think about it indirectly. This poem, in particular, though, has a direct. I argued uh, 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 with a little help from some other scholars that has a direct connection to the Dartmouth poem. Scholars long assumed that, so who's this Mrs. W's voyage? Who's, who's Mrs. W? Oh, well, obviously, it must be Susanna Wheatley. Problem is, Susanna Wheatley never went to England. And by the time she's writing this, she's actually quite ill. And there's no way that 67-year-old Susanna Wheatley is going on a voyage to England for the first time in her life. So uh, then it was thought that maybe it was um, it was uh, that there were other people who it could have been, other women it could have been. Actually, it's that guy Wooldridge who I was talking about, friend of Lord Dartmouth. His wife is named Susanna, Susanna Kelly Wooldridge. They've recently gotten married, and she's probably the one who makes the connection and suggests that he go see Phyllis Wheatley. She pro and she's, a, she's, actu she's actually has, has American connections, and she's probably knows Phyllis fairly well. 
So the, the key thing here is not so much that um, she's writing about Susanna Wooldridge, is that Susanna Wooldridge is one of the women who's really floating the whole, real, the whole idea of Phyllis as, as a poet who uh, deserves more than local recognition. She's performing her poems in these women's parlors. They're circulating her poems. Uh, to and they're they're in archives in Philadelphia where there are women poets who uh, who ha who copy each other's poems out in their commonplace books and so the, the this network of women is really is really especially important for her development. She also leaves a clue. She she signs the she at the bottom of the poem. She and, and this is actually in her in her book in in the book of poems she published in London, Boston, October 10th, 1772. She leaves that clue there. October 10th, 1772 is also the same day that, Tom, that, that uh, Thomas Wooldridge wrote his letter to Lord Dartmouth in closing Wheatley's poem. So it's, it's like she's sort of acknowledging this moment and this connection between the women and the men. Yeah, her ability to inscribe her own life within the neo neoclassical conventions is, is pretty amazing. It was one of the um, sort of eye-opening things in, in, in reading your text. Um, could you talk a little bit about, because the, the sun came up in the Dartmouth poem quite a bit. Could you talk about the sun as sort of personal and, and cultural memory? Because once, once you're keyed into it, the sun comes up in, in Aurora, Phoebus, Soul, um, comes up again and again in her poems. The only memory that's personal that we have from Wheatley that was recorded, it's in the uh, memoir by one of the Wheatley's grandnieces that was published in, as a preface to a, a, a republication of her poems in the 1830s. Uh, has Phyllis saying that she remembered her mother pouring out water to the sun in the morning. And so it's some kind of ritual. We would call it a religious one, whether that's appropriate or not. But I think that, offer, that offers a direct connection between uh, both the sun as an experience and as a personal experience tied to her actual life and her family and this literary tradition of the sun being, um, there being goddesses of the sun, the sun being a, 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 uh, the most natural force or even a, or a supernatural force. So it really, the, 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 the fact that she refers to the sun often um, is uh, is striking and and takes on more meaning when we when we when we know that there's also this really interesting moment in one of the reviews of her poems after they're it's, after they're published in London, where it's it's one of the it's one of the more critical reviews where the uh, author is, is saying of the review is saying you know she's really not that. Uh, she doesn't really know what she's doing with all the, with, she's not really that good a, a, a neoclassical poet because we all know that we, the people he's writing to, that, that, um, I mean, it's absurd, uh, that, that the, um, that the sun wasn't that important to the Greeks. Right, like I mean, like the, what's the like Mediterranean? Like I don't know what. Like he, he couldn't imagine that. Like basically, what he was saying is they don't talk about the sun. So how can a how can a good poet talk about the sun? She she's got it all wrong, right? So like you know, like you, there was a, the the neoclassical poetry was supposed to be creative imitation, and you're supposed to show that you really know what you're ripping on. She does that in spades again and again and again. But like it's it's really interesting that like in getting it wrong, he actually signals that she is doing her own thing. Right. And shows his own bias pretty heavily. Yeah. <laughs> and ignorant. Um, Excuse me, when you say neoclassical, what do you mean? Is there a certain time period that you're referring to? What does that mean? I'm a little confused when you refer to neoclassical. It, it means uh, there was a rage for do it for translating 
Greek and Roman classics and modeling poems and other literary works and architecture on the, on, on the Greeks and Romans. And this happened in like the 1750s, 1760s? It happened, it happened really from the late 17th century, but it, it increasingly with increasing intensity in the 18th century so that um, great poets in the mid 18th century uh, not only wrote their own poems that, had, that riffed on poems by great Greek and Roman poets, but they also translated them into English, and that was seen as a creative act as well as an act of piety toward the tradition. So Alexander Pope, one of, uh, one of Wheatley's favorite poets, also uh, was, became really famous in the 1720s when he translated the Iliad into iambic pentameter in English, and he, actually his Greek, his Latin was, his, his Greek wasn't all that good. He had a lot of help, but the main thing was that, you know, he got the, he, that he got the spirit of it, and then, then of course, they were all arguing about whether it's a better translation than so-and-so's, or so-and-so's, and in what way, but, uh, still happens, and right? it's still, you know, it's still, it's still being argued about, so that, that is what I mean by, uh, by, by neoclassical, and so, like, so that was, so that's really the terrain on which she, in which she's dealing. And for even for these uh, intensely Christian poets, uh, they don't see any, any necessary conflict. And actually, Pope talks about how um, uh, the, um, the, for that, there's no necess ne not necessarily a conflict between, uh, between riffing on biblical texts and classical ones, so long as you kind of acknowledge that these are that these are pagan wise men uh, uh, that are that that I'm talking about now, and that yeah, like and so that she often turns from in a, in in a, in some poems like on like one of her first on virtue that we we might talk about she actually turns from from making classical references to making Christian ones as if to say this is how we do it now we kind of go from this to that but but to them to them these are like these are that they actually reinforce each other. They're they're all ancients to them, but they're all but they're equally relevant, in a way. If we can if we can uh, uh, imagine that kind of um, that you have you have to sort of approach it from this this notion that like that um, that there are lessons like life lessons and ethical lessons, but also historical and political lessons to be learned from this literature, just like from the just like from the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament. And in New England, they're still reading the Old Testament and the New Testament as history, as well as for um, for inspiration and for law for for ethical precepts. And neoclassicism is why the Capitol building looks the way it does, the White House, like many of our like iconic American buildings, right? Right. So that's why why um, uh, <laughs> why why th I mean this is not this why do why do these columns look the way they do and why are they still uh, building and preserving houses like that? Well, I don't know whether these date to from the 1830s or from the earlier house. Um, maybe someone can weigh in on that. Who's uh, who knows who knows the place better than I do. But um, th it was, and that's why Monticello looks the way it does, Thomas Jefferson's home. Uh, this is, this is uh, and, and for, in the early United States, it kind of had a, uh, uh, a renewed life. It became a way of saying, we're getting back to these pure ancient precepts, not, this, not the way the British have corrupted everything. We're going to get back to the Roman Republic. We're going to get back to maybe Greek democracy. So that like there's a kind of simplicity and purity to that world. And you know, we, we won't we won't talk about we won't talk about how they had slavery. We won't talk about how they were at war all the time and maybe some of the things that weren't so admirable about the Greeks and Romans. We're thinking rather about their arts. We're thinking about how the depth of their thinking about 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 politics and about corruption and about um, uh, the good stuff, basically. All right. Coming back to Phyllis Wheatley. Um, so the, the poet June Jordan wrote one of my favorite essays. It's this beautiful lyrical essay about um, Phyllis Wheatley called The Difficult Miracle of Black Poetry in America or something like a sonnet for Phyllis Wheatley. And I'm going to read a short excerpt from it. She was nine years old. What did she read? 
What did she memorize? What did the Wheatleys give to this African child? Of course it was white, all of it white. It was English, most of it from England. It was written, all of it, by white men taking their pleasure, their walks, their pipes, their pens, and their paper rather seriously while somebody else cleaned the house, washed the clothes, cooked the food, watched the children, probably not slaves, but possibly a servant or, commonly, a wife. It was written, this white man's literature of England, while somebody else did the other things that have to be done. And that was the literature absorbed by the slave Phyllis Wheatley. That was the writing, the thoughts, the nostalgia, the lust, the conceits, the ambitions, the mannerisms, the games, the illusions, the discoveries, the filth and the flowers that filled up the mind of the African child. At 14, Phyllis published her first poem to the University of Cambridge, not a brief limerick or desultory teenager's verse, but 32 lines of blank verse telling those fellows what for and whereas according to their own strict Christian code, codes of behavior. It is in that poem that Phyllis describes the miracle of her own black poetry in America. While an intrinsic ardor bids me write, the muse doth promise to assist my pen. She says that her poetry results from an intrinsic ardor, not to dismiss the extraordinary kindness of the Wheatleys and not to diminish the wealth of white men's literature with which she found herself quite saturated. But it was none of these extrinsic factors that compelled the labors of her poetry. It was she who created herself a poet, notwithstanding and in despite of everything around her. It's such an, it's such an important essay um, and, and has been inspirational in the necessity of seeing what she, what she was up against culturally as well as practically in a day-to-day -day way. Um, We don't know how much she was laboring inside the Wheatley household. I think I, I, I argue that she almost certainly was uh, doing the work that other, that other women and other enslaved and indentured people did inside their pretty big house um, in Boston. And the, the, it's, um, but what I think what Jordan couldn't yet know because the scholarship hadn't yet made clear when she wrote that essay was that the women, the white women, who really don't, uh, she doesn't, I don't remember if elsewhere in the essay she talks about them, that they are, they're reading and writing too. And they're the ones who are her entry into this male-dominated literature. And they're the ones giving her the idea that it might be for her, too, and that there are things that could be done with it that might be a little different. Uh, so, uh, and that's, that's kind of a, that's a theme in my book, and it's also a theme, a theme in, the, in, the, in the recent literature. So, um, I think it's 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 important that um, we grapple with that while also appreciating that um, while she writes praise poems to these women like like Ode to Neptune uh, and writes for them and writes for their children and 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 when when a family member dies she writes elegies. A lot of her poetry is is literally for these women and like the poems that they wrote, they wrote for each other and for the larger community. It's really, it's really important that we be able to um, appreciate that she is seeing these possibilities while also experiencing a very, uh, a form of enslavement that was, that was very intimate, but still slavery and still, uh, uh, was under threat of sale. I think that, you know, without, without talking about how hard her life was, you know, on the one hand, we could say, 
well, you know, maybe they, 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 they gave her time to write. Or she, I, I like to think of her as a genius who probably didn't need to sleep. And that, like, <laughs> like there, there's testimony that they like get, let her keep a fire going at night. I think she kind of like stayed up all night. I think she was one of these people that, who d didn't need much sleep. That's, that's the, I think the most logical explanation for why, because I think she's working in the household all day and doing that too. And they think, oh, well, okay, there's no real choice here. She, we don't have to like give her, give her like an ongoing poetry fellowship that <laughs> renews every year that she can be both a worker and a, because, because, Something else that, that so th this this idea of poetry as a as this male world, there's this rage in the 1750s in London for working for worker poets, at seamstress poets. Uh, uh, they're, they're like the the aristocrats in England are basically like you know when they hear about some self-taught genius, they want to become the, their patron. And they look and when they do that, they're like, oh, like, like what an enlightened person this 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 lord is. He's not just someone who uh, has people toiling for them on his estate uh, or or um, or in the colonies. They're actually uh, uh, using their money in a philanthropic way. And people are aware of this and people are on the lookout for people like Phyllis Wheatley. Of course, in Boston, it's going to be an African. Uh, uh, at least as likely as it's going to be a, a white indentured servant. So um, that's part like, so, and I think everybody knows this and I think Phyllis Wheatley knows this. So that's part of the, so, so there's a whole kind of a, a history to uh, what, what people were doing with poetry, which, which was popular culture as well as high culture at that time. So when Wheatley writes that, that poem, the Cambridge poem in blank verse, and she's sticking it to the Cambridge, the Harvard students who aren't being pious enough. She's doing something very daring. She's taking on the role of a minister, but she's also doing it in blank verse. That's high end. That's actually like, like, look, I can do Milton, you know, here and, and tell you exactly what, what you're doing wrong. That, so she's showing that she, she can do this, this, this stuff that's, that's popular culture, elegies uh, on the death of graveyard poetry and at the same time do, do high culture. But that is, that is the game, that is what poetry is at the time. And sometimes when I'm teaching this stuff, I have to say like, look, you, you, guys, you guys listen to hip hop, you know that popular song has always been rhymed and still is. The ballads, the, this was an 18th century thing. People sang ballads in church and they read, po and they read poems like this and they were occasional, and they were religious, and they were political, and they were all the things that pop music is now. And that's what she's doing. Yeah, my, I was walking around the house reading um, her poems aloud, and my wife couldn't understand what I was doing. But I, it was sort of to, like, the iambic pentameter in the blank verse is, when you read it aloud, is, is so accomplished and so steady. Um, and the, I mean, there are, subst there are substitutions in there. There's anaphora and caesura. It, it's, it was such a pleasure to, to reconnect with, with, um, with her poems. I was in that Jordan passage, I'm also struck um, by her age. She was 31 when she died, right? And 19 when she, um, publishes the, the book of poems. By comparison, I was 31 when my first book of poems came out, right? Like she, she accomplished so much in uh, so little time, and it, it had only been 10 years from the time that she arrived in Boston to when she published her first book. Is that roughly well, accurate? Well, I, I get 12. Okay. <laughs> That's the difference between a poet and a historian. <laughs> but she's already published a lot of those poems already. Um, I wanted to read a Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem to, to, to set up a discussion of, of you, you had hinted at this, this sort of controversial poem on being brought from Africa to America. We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. We wear the mask that grins and lies, it hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but, oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but, oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. 
So that's in the, in the next century, right? Um, after, after Phyllis Wheatley Peters is, is writing. I'm being brought from Africa to America by Phyllis Wheatley. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes black as Cain may be refined and join the angelic train. So the depiction of, her depiction of Africa there um, catches fire, particularly during the black, black arts movement. Um, but kind of pursuing the, the idea that she's inscribing personal and, and cultural memories in, into her work, do you see her as, as masking in this poem and, and elsewhere in her oeuvre? Uh, well, yes and no. There's no question that there are times when she's pleasing people, pleasing audiences, very aware of what, of what, her, what, of what her audience is and what, and what they want. I actually think that this poem is about that. It's about, it's um, in, the, in this way that is analogous to Dunbar making that, making that a theme. The way I, the way I read it, um, those first four lines, when she says uh, that it's a mercy to be brought from Africa, this pagan land, and um, I didn't know redemption there and my soul was benighted when I was there. Uh, it's a conversion story. It's what her audience wants. But what she knows and what some of her readers would know was that the Methodists at this very moment were criticizing, pro were criticizing people who were arguing that conversion excused the slave trade. So the anti-slavery movement is really just getting started in the early 1770s. And people like John Wesley and others are and Anthony Benezet are explicitly saying that the excuse that Africans are going to be better off if they're brought here because it's a pagan land and because they enslave each other, that that won't cut it anymore. That, 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 that slavery is too systematically murderous and bad and ungodly for that. So what she's doing is, is she's rehearsing this argument that, that everybody's hearing and, and basically saying, I know you want me to say that. So why do I think that? Like, why am I, am I just making this up? If, if that wasn't the case, why would it then go to the next four lines? Some view, who? Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. <clears throat> She's talking about people who say that Africans are, di di they're pagan, they're diabolistic. From, go from, saying, from saying it herself, I was a pagan, she's saying, you people like exaggerate how savage and pagan Africans are and, and ascribe it to color. It's, the, 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 it's color itself that shows that the sable race is, is be scorned. And then she says, remember Christians, and Christians is italicized, so it's like so-called Christians. Remember you Christians, Negroes black as cane may be refined and join the angelic train. So I so I there I think there are different ways of reading. You could read it as pleading, you know, like like oh please remember that we can be saved. But what I think she's really saying, what she's really saying is, you know, remember you have already admitted that we can be saved. You know, like so I I think the whole thing is a is a trying to put a mirror up to the race to the racism of some of the people who are actually in the conversation about what the future of people like her is going to be. She's calling not just the pro-slavery people, but some of the anti-slavery people and some of the evangelical people on their racism saying, here's what you want me to say, actually you need to check your racism and you need to <laughs> think about what it, like how you're perceiving and how you're making everything about race when it really, that's not really what it's about. 
it's really about these larger structures that have made these made these uh, these distinctions. That's my interpretation. The five-page version is in the book. Um, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if you find it persuasive. Let me know. Um, I wanted to read two um, responses by by contemporary poets, and I think it will bring up uh, an issue of naming that you in the audience might have already picked up on. I, I think there's um, there's been a, a recent movement to call Phyllis Wheatley Phyllis Wheatley Peters um, because she's uh, married um, after she's emancipated later in life. You and I have different takes. We, we've agreed to disagree. Do <laughs> um, you want to talk a little bit about your, your side of, of the naming? Oh, before you read the poem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, some... Li- some, maybe a majority of literary scholars in the last couple of years have uh, decided that we should call Phyllis Wheatley, Phyllis Wheatley Peters, uh, and recognizing that she was married, she did go by the name Phyllis Peters after she was married, and that if we don't, we too easily forget that not only did she manage to get her freedom, uh, and we haven't talked about that, but it happens j- j- Around the time, or just after, just after she comes back from England in in, in 1773, that she made a choice to marry uh, uh, a, a very impressive black man named John Peters, and that uh, this was uh, not only something to be celebrated, but also uh, a decisive thing in her life. Uh, my my issue with it is that. She's been known as Phyllis Wheatley. She was known as Phyllis Wheatley for most of her life. She became famous as Phyllis Wheatley. And um, like a lot of famous people who try to change their name, it doesn't always take. You know, it's not always like, so then when, and she was never known as Phyllis Wheatley Peters. That's like, a, that's something that, that she would have done if she was a 20th century person or maybe a late 19th century person, but not, so it, it, it kind of, to me, it's sort of a, makes us feel good, but that's not exactly it. So I, I have a, it's a kind of, historians sort of discomfort with it but I don't know you know it's going to be what people want it to be so that's uh that's that's my my take on it so I don't I don't call her Phyllis Wheatley Peters but I do start calling her Peters after she's married um in the when I get to those chapters that that point in the chronology in the book yeah I think there's something powerful like the names Phyllis and Wheatley were not names she she chose and Peters was a name um that she chose in getting married. So I think there's something powerful for me in, in that name. And you know, we, when we were talking, you um, sometimes I wish the audience could hear the pre-talks to, to the talks because they're they're like as interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, but you asked me like, what are the other examples? Um, and I've been thinking a lot about a lot about that. And I think as you as comes out in your book, there aren't many people like like this figure, right? And, and maybe she needs a different naming convention. And we'll talk a little bit about legacy too. And I think some of it is just like the legacy she holds and what she did for American poetry and, and the black American poetic tradition. But um, I wanna read, um, so this is The Age of, of Phyllis. Um, it's a, a recent book by Honoré Fanon Jeffers um, that sort of imagines poetically um, Phyllis Wheatley Peters' life um, from from beginning to end. Um, and th- this is after she's she's been married. Searching for years, but failing to find documentation that Phyllis Wheatley Peters actually gave birth to three children who died in infancy or early childhood. If there were children, and how many children? If they were born, and were they called to God? If there were headstones, and a black mother weeping. If Phyllis rocked them, and how would you know? If there were children, and would that give you joy? If they had names, and three beloveds died. If there weren't children, and would that give you joy? If they were baptized, and where is the mercy? If they coughed and bled, and they perished in song. If like their mother, and they cried for home, if they reached water, and would that give you joy? If there was mourning and sisters weeping, 
if they were called, and what is this called? If they sang home, and what kind of mourning? If there is truth, and what has truth been? It's ironic and disturbing how little we know about the last years of Wheatley's life. It's ironic because she's, she's the most famous African in the Western world in the late 18th century in her lifetime, and yet we have so little documentation. I mean, we should, she, we should know, like with most, with writers, with famous people, we know more, usually we know more about the end of their life because everyone's paying attention to them and they leave behind stuff and it's the early part, right, that's hard to, with her, it's the early part and the late part. The middle part is easier to, there's more. Uh, and her marriage, whether she had children, whether they died, it's a, it's a lot to not know. And that's what Jeffers is talking about, what it's like to wonder and to feel like you can't do justice to her experience if we don't know those things. One of the toughest things I think that folks have about thinking about Wheatley is how much weight to give the fact that she dies young, quite possibly with one or more of her young, very young children at a time when her husband is in debtor's prison. And I, I think that it's, 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 uh, I've been concerned that sometimes the end of the story and the tragedy of it becomes proof of what wasn't possible and makes her life seem tragic and thus minimizes what she achieved as well as what people have made of it since, uh, which I talk about in a chapter that I call Afterlives. So uh, I, and I, I, exp I try to talk about this problem explicitly and wonder what she would have, um, what she would have wanted and, and pay, try to pay some attention to the last poem because she was still writing and publishing even though she, um, the, other thing, the other thing we need to take into account is that there's ample evidence that she had a chronic illness, that she had asthma or some kind of respiratory disease that she could have had all her life that could have been affected by uh, being uh, on a on a slave ship, and so we really don't the the basic facts about why she died, when she died, whether she died in childbirth, whether she died because of this chronic illness, whether she died because they were very poor because of things that had happened at a time when the economy was terrible. Uh, it's um, as a biographer and as a historian, I, I'm 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 wary of. And, and this, is, this also comes out of being a historian of, of, this, of, of, uh, of the founders and the founding era. And I'm, I'm, very, uh, I'm very suspicious of the, the way that we, we talk about the white founding fathers uh, based on the, how we perceive what they, what they did at the end of their lives as opposed to the whole story. So, and I wrote a book about Franklin and slavery, and Franklin makes the, Franklin is anti-slavery at the very end of his life, but there's a 50-year story in which he's basically not, right? But now we've decided he's an abolitionist as opposed to, uh, as opposed to others, and he, and so I, I was very, I, so I, I think this is a very important thing about the way, especially these famous and important figures, the way we sometimes kind of choose the part of their life that is most meaningful and say that's the, that's the whole story, that's the thing that reveals the total meaning of a, of a life and a history. And I, I don't think that, I think that especially with, with political figures and with figures who are deeply symbolic and with writers, it's really important not to do that, either for understanding their life or for understanding their art.
and its and its significance. So that's my my kind of. But I do think that what the what Jeffers is doing, forcing us to reflect on the significance of not knowing and not knowing that in particular is, and and and, I mean, and the way and to to uh, uh, um, uh, and to talk about the frustration of uh, like to to make poetry out of it, yes, but also to talk about the frust the sheer frustration of doing research and not finding these, not, not being able to know these important things and then being left with having to make meaning of it is something that I, I deeply, I feel, I, I felt with her. Yeah, I thought you might be able to relate to that. that t and that was like a, a very Wheatleyan po uh, title. It was so long in the, in the style of like 18th century poems. All right, uh, one last one maybe to get us thinking about um, Wheatley Peters' legacy. Um, so this is from a, a very recent anthology that came out at the end of last year called Wheatley at uh, 250. Um, this is a Tracy K. Smith poem, and the, the, the convention of the book is that the, um, a, a group of black female poets have written in response to Phyllis Wheatley Peters, and they will often use lines um, from her poems, so I'll kind of raise my hand when it's a, it's a Wheatley Peters line. Um, and this poem, not all the poems in the, in the anthology do this, but this poem in particular takes the title of a Wheatley Peters poem. On Virtue. You are like the old ladies my mother took me to visit whose brown hands kept nimble at small things, shelling peas on a porch or in a shady kitchen, stitching the hem of the world's dress which came loose every so often. I thought you were the gate through which I'd pass into bliss. Ma'am, sister, aunt, saint, what I've learned through ache and shame is a crumb of what you stayed knowing. Joy is a dark jar on a high shelf. A spoonful can last a lifetime. Widow, keeper, mender of light. To what new names do you now answer? What the bowl sighs to the whisk, how thumb greets husk, what night whispers into the nape of dusk. So what, what do you see as uh, Wheatley Peters' legacy? Like what, what lessons do, do her life and times sort of have for us in, in the current moment? <laughs> No, you can talk about the poem. Talk about what you want. <laughs> Do poem and then legacy. Okay. Um, there's this wonderful tradition of, of as, as we said at the outset, of poets responding to Wheatley. And um, it's... It's it's uh, really wonderful to see uh, as accomplished uh, a poet as Tracy Smith um, acknowledging that Wheatley is one of these foremothers who who knew and said much more than is on the page and is analogous to the. The, the the women in her family, and that we have to that we have to read and think of her that way. That it's that's um, that what we have is a miracle, but that that there's a um, a kind of uh, what she's talking about. She's talking. She, what I think I think what 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 I what I think she's saying in the poem is that what poets aspire to are these moments that are to convey that which is transcendent but also deeply personal and that to have a poet acknowledging that she is one of those people uh like and so both a foremother as a poet and a foremother as a mother as and as a woman uh is um really like taking it taking the kind of the use and riffing on Wheatley to another level. And, and, you know, the contrast would be with Jordan's essay, which is saying, which did 
praise her and say it's amazing, but also was emphasizing the, la the, the lack and the what wasn't possible. Whereas here we're going in another direction and insisting on the continuities and the, and the, the, the what was important was, ha was handed down. And uh, what to me, um, though I can't talk about it with the, the specificity about foremothers in the same way, I see Wheatley as a universalist. I think that she can speak to us because in a in a really important way now because like rather than being someone who couldn't talk about race and couldn't talk about slavery, she actually did do those things, but she also talked about uh stuff that applied to everybody, death, salvation. And she knew that she would be read in a way that related those things, that nobody was ever reading her without knowing exactly who she was. And yet she still insisted that what the poet should do and what she should aspire to was to reach everyone. And that's, I think that that is, um, a very useful and timely lesson. So I don't think there's a, I think that I do insist that she's a deeply political poet as Suzanne uh, foregrounded in, in introducing me. And I, and that is, that is the thing that, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book because I knew I could do that job because I'm a historian of this period and, and who's written about politics and slavery. I knew I could make that kind of contribution, but I, I'm also, uh, you know, I care enough about poetry that the other stuff is really, just as important in the book, and, and um, it's a great honor if, if people, to me, if people feel that I was able to convey that and um, be true to that. On that point about her, her as a universalist, one of my favorite lines is, we trace the power of death from tomb to tomb, which I think is just such a human, I think she, she is a political poet, but I think she's such a human poet as, as well. Um, thank you so much for en engaging with me in this call and response. <laughs> Do we have time for audience questions? You want to? Um, why do we know uh, so little about her later life? Oh, that's a great question, but that I should have I should have made clearer. Uh, one, what one re one the biggest reason is uh, also related to why we don't know that much about her previous life, which is that. Uh, the the Wheatley the White Wheatleys all died even before she did. the the twi the the twin the twins uh, um, Nathaniel and Mary uh, Nathaniel accompanies her to England and gets married there and eventually he comes back but he passes away. John Wheatley who doesn't leave her anything in his will uh, also uh, di dies in 1778. Susanna dies in 1774. So we, we have even less on the White Wheatleys than we do on Phyllis. Phyllis is famous. They're like forgotten. Like they were these, this elite family, this merchant family. And we know, the, the, I, you know, you scour the archives. You can only find like a few, like mostly business documents and, and a few letters from Susanna that are actually related to Phyllis and her trip. And, and a few of these things that are like two other, two, two ministers that she had in her home. So the, the reason, well, we don't, what we don't know because like Phyllis Wheatley, they die young and whatever they left behind didn't get preserved. So uh, six or seven of Wheatley's actual letters were only preserved because her, fr her friend, Obor Tanner, who lived in Newport, saved the, some of the letters she wrote to her and gave them to a white abolitionist woman when she was in the 1860s, when she was a very a very old lady, and then that that family gave them to the Massachusetts Historical Society, and that's why that's why we have those. Uh, so um, it really is. Uh, it could have been different. It could have been different, but that's why we we have so little of what, and that's why nobody. That's why there's only been really one real scholarly biography before mine, is because you would you would you would look at her and you'd say, how can you possibly write a biography about a person who left behind so little? 
So it really was about following these footprints and figuring out who the people who she did interact were about and what they were doing. And uh, I mean, I, a lot of it I built out of reading, looking at every page of every Boston newspaper from during her lifetime, which nobody who had nobody except um, William H. Robinson wrote a long introduction to an edition of her poetry in the 1980s, but he didn't he didn't have any footnotes, so I don't even know how much what sources he what he used. But from some of the details he has, it seems pretty clear to me that he he uh, he must have looked at looked into some of the newspapers. But uh, it's really um, we take for granted in this period that somebody's famous. Oh well, look how much we know about John Adams. Uh, look how much we know about Thomas Jefferson. These guys saved everything. That's why we know as much about them. Uh, I mean, other people save stuff on them too, but they save. But it's, it's really the people who saved everything, uh, as New Englanders tended to do. But it, <laughs> it helped. It helps when you don't die young and your children don't die young. That makes a big difference. We have a question over here. Um, I just wanted to comment on the earlier discussion about um, where was she thinking about what she was talking about being grateful for being taken from her pagan land, and it sounds like if you consider the thought of fight or flight that she was fighting, right? Because she didn't, she wasn't coming from a position of power which she could aggressively fight, right? Because mm -hmm. this is an era of slavery. So it sounds like she was using flattery and fighting as a way to convince people uh, that her cause was right. Mm -hmm. um, but also to uh, the other um, gentleman's comment about um, writing in, in Africa, which she had been as um, popular as she did in Africa. The oral tradition is it. However, also to consider, um, when stories are brought back and forth, people rarely bring the African stories out, right? Unless people of color bring it out themselves. And so during that time, how would her book have gotten across the water to the European and Americans? And considering there was colonization going on also in Africa where the British were then, you know, putting in the rubber lines and all the other things that were happening there. So I don't know if her story even if she was the most prolific of writers, could have gotten the traction where somebody would be like, hey, let's translate this into English, into multiple languages, and then print it, and put it on a ship, and bring it to England and the United States. Thank you, Wilson. Well Hi, Wilson. Um, thank you for your talk. You were talking about how Phyllis, when she was younger, was writing poems about other women when they died. I assume when you were looking and trying to find stuff, I assume you did this, but I take it there were then no other women at the time she died that were writing poems about her, which would have been a source of information. Uh, there were a few. There were, there were a few writing, writing about her. Uh -huh. Yes. And no, no, I did. Okay. I did. Um, there's, um, and um, there's a, 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 woman, uh, a woman and poet named Ruth Barrel Andrews who um, the scholar Wendy Roberts uh, unearthed her commonplace books of poetry. And um, we know more about her husband, John Andrews, who is, who I, who, whose letters, who, who is, who, who, in whose letters, and scholars have known this for a long time, in his letters, he's basically a fan. He's like, talks about poems that she wrote and, and her book coming out. And it's some of the best evidence we have about her process is things that he says. And uh, it turns out that you know, his interest in her may have been uh, completely inspired by, uh, by, by, by his wife. And uh, there's, there's one instance where I write a, where I, that I write about where um, uh, one of their cousins dies, uh, an, infant, an infant, Charles Eliot, and um, he writes to Ruth's brother, who is who is his business partner, that uh, Ruthie wrote Ruthie wrote a poem, but I, I, she doesn't want anybody to see it because Phyllis published her poem, and she was embarrassed because it wasn't as good as Phyllis as Phyllis's, right? So like like I, I wish I could send you Ruth's poem; it's really great, but she's feeling insecure about it, basically. <laughs> like that, that that like tells you everything you need to know. And she but she also wrote a poem. It, about about how about the, the African poetess. She doesn't name her, but it's clear who it's about, um, and and about about slavery, and in which she she ba she basically is alluding to Wheatley, where it's very clear that she it was one of her uh, supporters and um, uh, was inspired by her as well. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, and they're about the same age. Let's take one last question. Yeah. Since Hornet, did you mention this before? Forgive me. At what age was she emancipated? And I assume it's before all the white hippies died. Yes. Okay. At what age was this? She is, this is 1773, probably, uh, or, or early 1774, when she is uh, 21, 22. And she started writing before that? Yes, well, well before that. So she's writing yeah. and publishing by 1767 when she's only 14. Um, so it takes a lot of bravery. Is my yes. Opinion. Yes. And one of the one of the tricky things about knowing why and when she was emancipated is she said different things about it to different people. And I have a whole chapter on this laying out the scenarios. But the fact that she is like that she is like of that age when you're considered an adult, definitely an adult, suggests that it may have been in the cards already. They may have had an agreement that like, the, and there's this notion that like that the book was supposed to maybe fund her emancipation, that selling it would then enable her to have to to be able to support herself it didn't it it didn't really work out that way but she definitely talks about how the how now i'm free and everything all the proceeds from the books are going to be mine so it's clear that that is part of the part of the part of the deal but it's but how exactly she gets emancipated and why is is um is not completely clear and my interpretation is that that actually she talks about it different ways to different people because she she can't seem like she made it happen that white people don't want to hear that, and so she kind of covers her tracks, is what she does. Is that is, I think, is what I think happened. Okay, we have one more question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious if there's very much information about uh, how she um, affected the ideas of the uh, revolution. I'm, I'm involved in a musical where we're kind of exploring some of the antecedents, and um, anyway, so I'm just curious, did she have any, I know, I know she met Washington, and he had a very, you know, interesting conversation with her. But was she in dialogue with other founding fathers, other individuals, um, other than through her poetry, which I know that they all read? Right. It depends how we define, how broadly we define the revolution, uh, uh, how we measure her impact in it. But one of the things I, li I like to stress is that she had significant interactions with four major political figures, Franklin, Washington, Jefferson, and Lord Dartmouth. Uh, and they're responding to her. They're responding to her, her, her poetry and her reputation. And uh, those interactions are very interesting and revealing. They are part of a larger push by Africans that brings the issue of slavery a lot closer to the center of the politics of the revolution and it's, it's a sort of an ongoing thing that is happening and that Washington is still aware of during the war when he gets her praise poem, sits on it for a few weeks at this very moment when they're trying to figure out whether they're going to allow blacks to serve in the Continental Army and then he decides Okay, I know. Uh, then they, he, and the and the Continental Congress decide. Okay, we're going to let free. We're going to let the. We're going to let free Africans serve. We're going to let Africans serve if their masters free them. But we're not going to let slaves serve. And that's how we're going to finesse this thing that's become such a hot political hot potato because of what the British are doing have done in Virginia, which is basically say that slaves of disloyal people can serve and be and and become free in the process. And they make that decision in December of 1776, and then he writes her a letter saying, you know, thank you for your poem. Uh, I, I, uh, I was embarrassed because it's so much praise, but like, you know, and, but, and I, I can't like, I can't spread this around. But then he gives it to, he gives it to Joseph Reed and they get it published in, in the Virginia Gazette and a Pennsylvania newspaper. So why is he doing this? Well, Washington is actually getting a lot of criticism for his generalship at this time. And he knows very well, and he's, he's about to put David Humphreys, the poet, on his uh, young poet who wrote him a praise poem, on his staff to be like, you know, like the in-house poet laureate. 
So Wheatley is bidding to be another poet laureate of the revolution in writing this praise poem for Washington and advance the cause of Africans who may become free because of the Revolutionary War, whether or not the patriots decide that slavery is going to be wrong in the future, it might lead, as wars always do, to some black people becoming free, including people she actually knows in New England who are, who are um, serving in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts already. Uh, un, under arms. So this is like diplomacy. This is like, so, so does she affect? She absolutely affects the politics of, of um, what the role of, 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 of enslaved people and Africans during the war is going to be, and that's going to have huge implications. Um, and Franklin knows this when he responds to her and he goes to visit her. And she, uh, when, uh, when she's over in England, and I talk about that, but, but she also knows that having, having a relationship to Franklin is important. She when she proposes a second volume of poems in 1779, she says she proposes to dedicate it to Franklin, like basically suggesting that he's on her side more than he actually has, has been. So, so she is really inhabiting this, this role of, of the basically representing the race, the most famous black person around, and seeing that, and, and knowing that this might affect the, the revolution, Great and fun. and we see we see this with the we see this with her interactions with this, and also I'll just say with Jefferson, uh, that's him reacting to her and her reputation after she's dead, and it's not a happy story. It's um it's she he he tries to say that she's just a a religious poet and not really a good poet and not even and not really even a good neoclassical poet, and he's doing that in a in a particular context that I I, that I talk about as well. In, when he writes notes book. on the state of Virginia. Yes. What, as much of what you just shared? Yes, yes. more yes. of it in the <laughs> book, yes. Thank you all. Can we invite everyone to stay uh, for the reception and have a, a book inscribed, one for family, please? Um, but thank you all for coming. Our next talk is in April with Doug Calamay. Uh, we hope you'll join us then.